Hey guys, welcome back to another unboxing. Today we have the pearl expert Gina Latondres with us. And I understand that you brought us some cultured pearls to look at. I did. Well, the majority of pearls on the market today are cultivated. And so we're gonna talk about where they're cultured and how we do it. You never know what you're gonna find. What is this? I see some shells and some things in bags. So can you tell us what we have here? Yeah, so I brought with you today a little example of how culture pearls uh, are cultivated. And basically we start with a nucleus. Well, a lot of people don't know this, the seed for all culture pearls around the world, if it's a round seed, it comes from the United States, from the Tennessee, Mississippi, Ohio rivers. Really? Yes. So if you were to cut a Japanese pearl or a Tahitian pearl in half, you would find a round seed that came from the United States inside. Wow. Yeah, I didn't know that. Modern pearl cultivation started in the early 1900s. Okay. And they were experimenting with uh, glass, uh, metals, uh, woods, and the most uh, hardy and the most abundant nucleus that they found was the freshwater mussel shells from the United States of America. So the Mississippi, Tennessee, and Ohio River Valleys. Now, if you wanna create round culture pearls, you have a round seed. So I brought the round seed with you. And the way the round seeds are made is the shells are harvested from one of the lakes and rivers or the tributaries thereof. Okay. And then they're sliced, as you can see over here. And then they're diced. And then they are put into a machine that's called a milling machine and they ground them into these round beads. And that's what those round beads are. So those are the seeds for culture pearls. So if this is the seed, the pearl is gonna form around it. Correct, okay. yes. So it would be creating layers, nacre and nacre and nacre every month, week, and year to create the culture pearl. How thick around is the nacre gonna form? Well, ultimately we love it to be about a, a millimeter thickness, but sometimes they're much thicker than that. Okay. So it just depends on the cultivation time and the pearl form and the technique. Where do you go from there? So in pearl culture, there's different types of cultivation uh, procedures, but essentially what we do is you would take a mollusk and a pearl technician, a very skilled one, would take a scalpel, open the mollusk up just like this, just, just big enough for the nucleus to fit in. Now they create what we call a pearl sac. The okay. pearl sac then, uh, we insert the round bead. If you want a round pearl, you put a round seed in. And the next little special ingredient is the uh, pearl tissue graft. You put the graft in there with the seed, which has epithelial cells. Now these epithelial cells will help heal that pearl sac so that the muscle can close back up and be put back at the pearl farm for 18 months, up to three years and maybe more. Wow, that's a there's a lot more that goes into it than I would think. But we also have just where you just use graft tissue. So the seed technique would be called bead seeding and the tissue would be called tissue nucleation. That's so interesting. Yeah. So you also brought two half shells. I did. One is pink and one is more of a white bluish color. And I understand that this is gonna determine the color of the pearl that comes out. The common name that we call it is the blue for shell, the scientific name as well. And we also have this one, which is called the washboard shell. So the reason why it is called the washboard shell is because it looks like an old, instead of having a washing machine way back <laughs> when, it, they used washboards to, to wash your clothes on it. So that's why this is called the washboard shell. And where are these two from? They both can be uh, from the Tennessee River, but we have multiple lakes and rivers that they could live in as well. So can I blow your mind for a minute? Yes. <laughs> so we've talked about round culture pearls, right? If you want a round pearl, you put a round seed in. Okay. If you want a coin shape or a disc shape pearl, you put a disc nucleus. Or if oh. you want rectangular, you put a rectangular nucleus in there. Oh, so okay. So this is how this is formed. So when you see different shapes of pearls, oh, you can then so... recognize the shape of the nucleus. Oh yeah, that's so cool. Because there are so many different shapes of pearls. Mm -hmm. And so it's really interesting that you're gonna put the specific shape that you want as a nucleus to get out this shape. Absolutely. 
Yeah, so I'm actually wearing one of the rectangular pearls. We call it the bar-shaped pearl. It comes from the Tennessee River, and I'm wearing a coin on my neck here, coin shape. Oh, cool. Yeah. So what I'm holding here, you can see these are the coin shapes. Some are a little mm -hmm. bit more perfect. Some are a little more out of round. Some might even have like a little, what we call the, the special characteristics for each pearl. Um, mm -hmm. Because these do come from the river uh, pearl farm, I do also say it sort of has a river texture to it. Yeah. You see some of the bars here, the bar shapes. And you can see if they've grown just a little bit longer, they've got these more um, extensions or these tips on them. And that's because either the graft tissue has extended itself out there mm -hmm. or there was a period of time where it just started growing a little extra nacreous area right there. The majority of the pearls turn out more Baroque. They're not always round. They're not always perfect coins or bar shapes. They will have these own little characteristics if they've got enough nacre mm -hmm. nacreous growth on them. Yes, for sure. All right, so this is really cool, but I understand you have more for us. I do. Ooh. I think I spy some jewelry. Yes, okay, so we've got a lot of jewelry and these are beautiful. So can you tell me about these, you know, where did they come from? Like where were they cultured? And tell me a little bit about the different colors. Sure. So I'm gonna start with this one because I love to sort of blow people's minds again with the thought process of, you know, when we, we cultivate round culture pearls, we use the round seed. And if you can see very closely here, there is a round bulbous seed right yeah. there. But when you look at it as a whole, it just looks like Baroque pearls. Mm -hmm. um, these have been allowed to grow out of round from this round seed. So you can see now why you would need a large round seed in order to cultivate this size and shape. Yeah. Now these are freshwater pearls, but there are saltwater um, Australian pearls that also grow and look very similar to this as okay. well. Yeah, and these are large. That's, I think that's the one where I picked it up and I was like, oh, this is heavy. <laughs> <laughs> so what do we have here? I noticed it's similar shapes, but is this just smaller nuclei? Yes, it's smaller nuclei and it's also natural color. So when we talk about classic rounds, of course, here mm -hmm. we are. We put in the round perfect bead nucleus and we come out with some round perfect cultivated pearls. Yes. And these are actually surprisingly freshwater. Oh, okay. I did bring some salt water with us, but I wanted to show that freshwater pearls can also be seeded with round nucleus, and they can be very, very round and very high luster. There's a large majority of freshwater pearls that are um, just tissue nucleation, so they're okay. not round at all. Oh, okay. I love to bring these. So we really love this because it tells the story about this particular type of pearl is called a twin pearl, where there were two pearls that were growing in two different pearl sacs and the pearl sacs sort of came close together as the pearls were getting larger and the pearls fused together. And so there are some mussels or oysters that you can seed with more than just one seed. And so this is a prime example. It gives you the idea of, okay, this one had more than one pearl growing in it, but they got fused together, so they call them twin pearls. That's really cool. You know, from afar, I didn't notice that, but up close, you could, yeah, you can see that they're kind of like, you know, fused together. I think that's really interesting. Now these would be non-beaded, so if you were to cut those in half, it's all nacreous all the way through because they were tissue nucleated. So what you're holding there are some freshwater pearls that are tissue nucleated. I just wanted to show this because we would call this um, out of round, but visually speaking, I'm gonna put this other strand right next to it. If you were ha to have them on your neck, they look eye round, even mm -hmm. though they're not round round. And so these are sort of the out of round, some people call them potato shapes or pillow mm -hmm. shapes. These are, look like a teardrop shape. They are teardrop shapes. So I added this strand in just to give the idea also, and because we've gone over all the other strands, that you're, we're successfully culturing pearls, but every time you put a tissue nucleation in, that doesn't mean that the shape that you think that's gonna come out is gonna come out. So it's kind of like a surprise at the yeah. end. And as you're harvesting and coming out with your pearls, you then have to put them in the buckets and somebody will go through those buckets and sort them by size and shape and color and luster. So every time you open up a, a mussel in the freshwater situation, you never know what you're gonna find. I think it's important to note that pearls have their own unique luster, it's called pearlescent luster, and since no other gemstone is gonna have that, it has its own name for its luster. It does. Uh, the luster really is the reflection uh, of the surface of the pearl back, back to our eyes, but pearls also have what we call orient. 
um, which is more of the rainbow colors that are playing and within the layers of it. Can I ask you how you got into pearl culturing and pearl farming? Well, I got into it naturally. I was from a family who was already in the pearl business. My father started the company in 19... Well, he started in 1949. Okay. And when we were young kids, it was just normal. You know, daddy's going to work and it's summertime and you're coming with me. So I got started when I was eight years old. Oh, wow. Yeah. So these two, we have two different colors of the of pink pearls. Yes. Right here. So as you can see, the different color in the pinks. Now, that doesn't mean that each mollusk that it came from different types of moss. It could be the same species, but one just produced a little bit more of the tangerine light orange color or the more mauve pink lavender tones. But they're both considered pink within our industry. Is there some sort of guideline or like hard line when you're talking about a what exactly is a pink pearl or is it one of those things where if you're trying to sell it, you're gonna call it one thing and if you're trying to buy it, you'll call it another. <laughs> well, that could be true. It's all in the eye of the beholder. So my my visualization of what pink might be might be different from yours mm -hmm. or someone else's. So generally speaking, anything that's of natural color, we call it the pink tones. Okay. So again, here we go with the different shapes, mm -hmm. the more organic shapes. These are a little more uniform in their shape. We call these button shapes. Okay. And this particular way that we've drilled them and put them onto the strand, we call them center drill buttons. So instead of the button being the dome um, on the top facing you, they're side by side, sort of like cornrows. The one um, that you're pointing to now is what we call the corn shapes. Looks like corn on the cob. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> the, but there's different colors there. And they, we also call them center drill buttons. So they're, they're drilled through the center of the button and then strung onto the strand. These are not white and they're not pink. So this is an interesting type of pearl. So we're going to talk about a more specific word called keshi pearl. So the term keshi originates as a Japanese word for poppy seed. And so when the Japanese pearl culture started in the early 1900s, when they were inserting their round nucleus, they might put two pearl nucleuses in. And when they harvested, they would get two round pearls and two little bitty pearls like these. And they were like, oh, what's well, a little surprise. Yeah. Um, they call them keshi pearls because they were side of poppy seeds. So the theory of these is that the epithelial cells in the graft tissue process part sort of floating around inside of the oyster to create some other pearls. And so the keshi pearls then became a thing. They asked, after they started collecting enough of them, they drilled them and put them into strands. So when we say keshi pearls, it literally means that these pearls were not intended to be cultivated but they were part of the pearl farming process. So we have to call them keshi culture pearls okay. and they're tiny. And the black ones come from the black lip oyster in Tahiti and French Polynesia. Okay. So you say natural colors, can you dye pearls? Yes, you can. Okay. These are freshwater pearls coming from China. And every year they come up with some new colors based on any fashion colorations that are happening in the world. We call them enhanced colors. Okay. And they typically are permanent. They don't it does not fade and does not change. Okay, that's cool. In order to actually dye pearls, you have to drill them. So you can't just take a pearl from the mollusk and put it into a liquid and hope that it's going to absorb it because okay. the layers are closed. So you have to drill the pearl in order to get this uh, dyed color. Oh, okay, that's yeah. cool. So now we have these. Yeah, so here. this is where our story started, right? We started in the early 1900s with the pearl cultivation invention in Japan, and they searched the world over to create round culture pearls, and they found the nucleus in the United States. And here we have um, some beautiful Japanese culture pearls, salt okay. water. Salt water. Mm -hmm. And they call them Akoya. Akoya, okay, so mm -hmm. these are Akoya, and they're pretty round. So there's only gonna be a small percentage, let's say it's 10% of the harvest that's gonna be this perfect white, perfect round pearl. The others are going to be a little more Baroque, a little tips on the ends, um, even more Baroque, and then different qualities as well. So to end up with a very nice high quality strand that you're holding there um, is a very small percentage of the, of the harvest. In the case of white pearls, when they come out of the oysters, they are white, but in order to create a little bit whiter or more uniform colors, they will soak them in something they call a, a light bleach, but it's a normal process. It doesn't harm the pearls. Okay. Just make sure that they all have a it's more of uniform uh, white coloration. 
Okay, so where are these from? So these come from Australia. These are what we call the Pinctata Maxima, the white lip oyster uh, from Australia. And as you can see, they are beautiful, very round, and quite lustrous. Their oyster is the largest in the world to create culture pearls. Okay. So some of the largest, the largest saltwater pearls come from that region. All right, we have some more black pearls here. These are Tahitian culture pearls. So I brought uh, two examples here to show the different colorations. These both come from black lip oysters. And as you can imagine, you've got this bucket full of pearls again, mm -hmm. and we have to sift through to find pearls that are gonna match each other. So the ones you're touching there have more of a bluish, greenish tone, and those um, more of the black tone with what we call the peacock, and they are natural colors. Oh, that's, that's really cool. I think this is a really good example of what you were talking about earlier with what you call orient in terms of like color coming back at you because you can kind of move them around and here I'm getting some places a little bit more blue or green and then here it's kind of a red purpley type color and maybe almost coppery. Yes, I mean this is very typical of the Tahitian culture pearls. Okay, so here we've got some earrings. Yeah, so I don't want to leave anybody out. We've got a golden lip oyster um, that creates golden colored pearls. And as you can see, we have the round uh, studs there. Those are have the round nucleus in them. And the smaller ones are what we call the keshis. This is an organic material, so anything in the environment is gonna affect the way it's growing and you know how long it takes and everything you know just a slight I guess like a slight variation in the temperature is gonna change what you get out of it yeah yeah so you're exactly right there's many variables to pearl farming we have the weather we have to consider whether there's going to be too much rain not enough rain the temperature of the water could change there could be something in the water there could be like in Japan they've experienced what they call red tide and it has not been good for the oysters it's not been good for any marine life actually um, and so when those particular things happen, yes, the, the mussel or the oyster populations are affected, deeply affected. What do we have here and how would you relate it to everything yeah. else on the table? So these pearls come from the Tennessee River. This is uh, American cultured pearls and they're actually nicknamed or named lanyap pearls. So the word lanyap is a, a term that's used in New Orleans and lanyap is a baker's dozen. It means a little something extra. So you go to the baker and you pick, you want a dozen and they give you 13. So that's a little like something extra from the, from the baker, <laughs> right? So in pearl farming, it's very similar. We go to implant two nucleus into the mussel shell and went at harvest time we got two coin pearls and we got two unusual shaped pearls so in the saltwater situation you would call those keshi pearls but because these come from the freshwaters of the Tennessee River we have renamed them the lanyap pearls because they are a little something extra from pearl farming in Tennessee oh that's really cool so in the beginning of time of us cultivating pearls in Tennessee my father was interviewed once and was asked you know well, how do your pearls compare to the Japanese? And he's like, well, they're from the United States. And the question was, well, how do they compare? And he said, well, they're domestically grown. They're from the United States of America. That's why they're different. So we went back to the drawing board mm -hmm. and he goes to the pearl farm and he's like, I need to create some type of pearl that's very unique that someone could recognize the world over. And so then he came up with the coin, the bars. We also have some marquee and navette shapes. Um, very rare uh, triangular shapes as well. And he became known as sort of the Pearl Picasso, uh, <laughs> Pearl designer, so to speak. Um, so yeah, the pearls from Tennessee that are grown in Tennessee have their own unique shape. This one's smaller. <gasps> oh! We have another shell and a bag labeled seed pearls. <laughs> so what do we have here? So I've got a couple little things I wanted to talk about. Well, what we have in your hand here is a Tahitian culture pearl, salt water, natural color black from Tahiti. Mm -hmm. And if you flip it over, we're gonna look inside it. I've cut it in half. And as you can see, the black layers there, that is the nacreous layers from the black lip oyster. And that white center is the seed that comes from the Tennessee River, a freshwater mussel shell from North America. Oh, that's really cool. The, uh, the journey that the pearl has to go through to be cultivated and get to the market is not short. 
It is not. It starts uh, at the depths of the Tennessee River and ends up in the blue, pristine waters of Tahiti. Two very different colors of water. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. What do we have here? These are very small. Yes, so we call these seed pearls because they literally are the size of tiny little seeds. Sometimes these small pearls can also rival the price of the larger pearls. And they asked me, well, why? And I said, well, would you want to sit and sort these and then hand drill each one of these and put them on a string? There's time and labor and a lot of effort put into these pearls. Yeah. And you'll have some of these on your website. If I were doing it, they would not turn out very nice. <laughs> So what kind of shell is this? So this is also one of the washboard shells that comes from our Tennessee Pearl Farm. And I'm using this today as an example to show you what we might call a blister pearl. Some people might also call it uh, a mabe pearl. From our Tennessee Pearl Farm, we call it a dome pearl or a blister pearl, but you can kind of see it right there by your thumb. We put a implant in right here. Right here. Oh, yeah, okay. right there. yeah, right there. <laughs> Uh, and so the implant was um, glued to the interior of the muscle and it was allowed to grow for 18 months. And then you can cut this portion of the shell out when you're ready to make a piece of jewelry out of it. Oh, okay. Yeah. And then the rest of the shell is then recycled and you can imagine what it's gonna be recycled as. Another pearl. <laughs> a nucleus, exactly. Okay, so on this channel, we always choose one thing from the table that we want to take a closer look at. So do you know what your favorite thing or your favorite piece was today? Mm, I have so many favorites, but I'm more drawn really to the seed pearls. I'm in awe in the fact that we harvested these, we sorted them, we matched them up, we drilled them and we put them on strings and then we can wear them, you know, as adornments. And I just think they're amazing. I'm going to choose this blue fur shell. Um, I think the color of it is beautiful. It's really interesting to see the f where the pearl has to start and then what is then going to have to do a lot of work to turn it into a pearl that we love. Yeah. So let's take a closer look. Okay, Dina, thank you so much. This was like, this was a very interesting. I love pearls, so I'm so glad that you brought all of this. And I understand that you're gonna be leaving us some stuff that we can sell, so make sure you guys check the link in the description below. What was your favorite thing from today's episode? Let us know down in the comments. And while you're there, don't forget to like, subscribe, and ring the bell so you don't miss our future videos. Bye.